are on. And three, two, one. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Salt Lake Chamber, welcome to the candidate forum for the first congressional district of Utah. This is the second in our series of candidate forums, which will cover all the major races that are taking place this fall. They will each be held Tuesday at 4 p.m., just like this one, with one exception, and that's our gubernatorial forum that will take place this Thursday, September 24th at 4 p.m. We invite you to join us for all of these forums, and you can find out more about them on our website at slchamber.com. I'm Derek Miller. I'm the president and CEO of the Salt Lake Chamber, and I'm joined today by my co-host, Abby Murtaugh, who is the general manager of Hilton Hotels. We're streaming live today from the Salt Lake Chamber offices. Abby? Thanks, Derek. This forum will focus on the issues facing Congress that are important to the business community. Each candidate will have, the, have approximately 30 minutes to respond to a set of questions. The number of questions each candidate will be able to answer will depend on the length of their answers. So to waste no further time, let me introduce our first candidate, Blake Moore. Blake is from Ogden, Utah, and is a graduate of Utah State University and Northwestern University, where he earned a Master's of Public Policy and Administration. He began his career with the Department of State working in the Foreign Service. He currently works with the Cicero Group, a Utah-based consulting firm where he provides public policy work and advice to private companies. Blake, thank you for being here today. As a first-time candidate, what motivated you to run for office and for Congress specifically? Thank you. Uh, thanks to the Chamber and folks that are, that are out there listening. Um, they'll always thank you for coming to events like this. And, and uh, this is what I signed up for. Uh, people that are willing to listen and vet and participate in this process. Uh, I'm, I'm really grateful for, for, for people's engagement and, uh, and especially for the chamber. I've had an opportunity, you know, the, throughout the, before running for office, during the campaign, and now chambers from all across, from Salt Lake today, and Cache Valley, Bernal, and Ogden Weber, there's all sorts of chambers that are getting really involved and I really appreciate it. Um, I decided to run for Congress because I felt like I had something really unique to offer. Um, I have never held political office before, and I felt like I had, as you mentioned, a federal level experience working in Washington, D.C. and abroad, and also uh, here in the business community in Utah for you know, management consulting. Management consulting is really unique, and you get to, you get to work in every industry possible, um, from healthcare to education to trash and recycling. To, to energy and transportation, all those types of industries, nonprofit, public sector, private sector, across the board. And, and I see that as, as, as essential to the job of Congress. And I just, I felt like I had something unique, unique to offer. Um, but I think two of the things that probably qualify me the best is a sincere willingness to listen and collect and take input and a desire to do so, just to work really hard. Blake, I get to ask you a question about the economy. Sure. It's a two-part question. Obviously, we're all aware that we're in the middle of a pandemic and the economic consequences as well as the health consequences of that pandemic. It's commanded everyone's attention for almost a year now. Mm -hmm. What would be your number one priority in Congress to address the short-term economic needs? And what would be your top priority for long-term economic growth? I, uh, the sh for short-term, we have to target and make sure that small businesses have what they need to thrive. I've recently seen marketing research that, that shows almost up towards, upwards to a third of small business owners um, say that if things stay status quo, remotely even status quo for the next six months, they might not survive past that. That's a staggering concern. And we've been able to use care package money and be able to kind of prop up our system for a time but we have, we have something really, really concerning down the road. So we need to be able to make sure that the small businesses, the core of American economy, has what it needs to thrive. The right tax policy, the right regulatory environment so they can come out of this. Uh, that's, th that would be the initial area that I would focus on, working with organizations that are, that are targeting that and making sure that that's, that that's a priority. With regards to, to long term, I, uh, two, two, two things come to mind making sure that we have 
our education in a place where we can always meet the job, the demands of the, of the next economy or what the future jobs need. And maybe we had a chance to talk more about that, but, uh, and just ensuring that we have, again, what our business community needs to thrive long-term, what regulation, or all these policies with respect to tax policies, everything is subject to whoever's in power in Congress. There is plenty of case studies and history within our entire economic system to look back and say, where can we all agree to get it, our, our, our economy in the right place going forward? So however is in the majority in Congress, you know, can't always be disrupting that. And so that's something that I would want to, you know, I look out 10 years in advance thinking about that. Thank you. Great, thank you. You mentioned the core of American economy and education. And the next question, kind of relates to both. This pandemic has brought to light the need for every student to have a device, an adequate home broadband connection. How would you propose modernizing the broadband funding and make sure that every student who is in need has a device and a home connection? What, if any role, should the state play? And specifically, how will you meet the broadband needs in rural Utah? Yeah, the, the rural piece is really important. And when we think rural, we think Duchesne, Uinta County, but as I've talked to Senator Ann Milner, even what a dire need in particular, even in Morgan County, which is just right off the Wasatch Front, that there's areas there that, that, that need this. This is an investment. This is good. This is something that all, people, all of us can agree on. We've just seen how important it is. And it's not just for education. It's going to be for you know, our healthcare needs, if we can engage more in the telemedicine type of opportunities. There is a lot of need that, that we can and take this effort. Sometimes it creates, sometimes there's a, there's a disruption in, in, in our way of life that will highlight, you know, where things are deficient. And this is an area that we can all be supportive of. You make this investment, this is a good, this is a good investment. Yes, it will cost some. The Rural Online Initiative is, is things that some of our, you know, our, our congressional membership has already been supportive of. We're, we're thinking strongly about it at the state level. This is an area that's good to to invest in and, and uh, something that we'll get positive results out of in the long run. Let's turn our attention to healthcare. This has also been a hot topic in Congress for a long time now. Um, about 60% of Utahns receive their healthcare through their employer, through their job. It's one of the highest in the country. And at the same time, most businesses report that it's their second highest expense, overall expense right after wages. With Utah businesses and families struggling to manage those growing healthcare costs, what are some of the issues that Congress can do to address the urgent need as well as to just get something done in Congress? Uh, um, my response to this won't necessarily uh, talk specifically about employers covering the healthcare. That's a bit of a separate issue. The, the best way for Congress to create positive change here is is pricing transparency and visibility right let's get back to the very basics that is such an important thing in every in so many consumer based markets consumers in healthcare do not have any control there's nothing that they can be able to go and look and and see what things are costing the the head of the committee right now it's a, he's a senator from Tennessee uh, I believe it's Alexander don't Lamar Alexander he, he tells a story about needing to go get an echo test. And uh, he, after painstakingly trying to figure out how much the actual cost was gonna be, $3,500, was able to find a different location and provide the same test for under $1,000. Consumers having that power will create more affordability in the market. I think that's the key thing. Now there's, it's a complex issue, I get that. But that's the one area that I would focus on. And uh, there's, there's, a, there's at least, work going from the Trump administration to, to, to really target that particular issue. Thanks. Blake, although not always recognized as such, Utah is a very diverse place. Here at the Salt Lake Chamber, we are actively engaged to make sure that this moment of focus on the importance of equality of opportunity, diversity, and inclusion does not pass without resulting in real change. As a representative of Utah in Congress, how will you ensure that Utah is viewed and actually is an equitable, equitable, diverse, and inclusive place to live and to do business. That's great. Um, I've had an experience with this in the Utah 
market? You mentioned that I'm with a consulting firm here in Salt Lake City. For about three years during that time, I've been there for, for eight years, about three years of that, I was sort of dedicated internally to uh, HR or no, hiring, recruitment, finding talent, recruiting talent and, and to come. And uh, this is diff it's difficult to make sure that you have a diverse workplace. If you're committed to hiring the most qualified candidate, um, you have to go about the way that you get a, an entire crop of talent to be able to come into the system. Uh, and so having, having experienced this, the things that I would probably point to, um, I remember as I had that role, there were a lot of organizations. You mentioned the Salt Lake Chamber is important, you know, working on it. I remember there was a group, HR Summit, that would, they would host the summit every year and they would always encourage us to get involved. They have all the best tactics and strategies to go about making sure that what you do is you open up your funnel, open up the top of funnel, making sure that you can encourage and incentivize, you know, diverse workload. You talk about Utah being diverse, it, it is, it may not always, you know, be presented as that, but with a strong economy comes a lot of interest from all over the country and we're seeing it happen. We've seen it happen throughout and our, our, our companies need to always make sure that we embrace that. I'm not going to fix that as a congressman. I'm not going to be able to do it. But, but I've lived that experience and I can communicate how, how good we can do here and how we are actually working on a lot of efforts locally with organizations like I mentioned. As you know, politics is a divisive thing, especially in, in today's world. It's becoming more and more polarized and it seems like the divides are becoming even greater. I want to ask you as a member of Congress how you will bridge those divides and maybe I would just insert my own personal experience in this question, Blake. I used to be a legal counsel for Congress and we had a saying uh, when people would ask, what is it like working for Congress? We would say, well, think of the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of the time you get things done, 20% of the time you fight, but you only hear about the 20% of the time on TV, yep. in the news. When I talk to my colleagues who still work for Congress today, they say, Derek, it's totally flipped. Now we're fighting 80% of the time and we're lucky if 20% of the time we could get something done. Tell us how you would go about, if you're elected to Congress, bridging some of those divides and seeing if we can get back to 80% of the time getting work done. Yeah. The, the, the piece that I really liked that you said there was it, the good, the productive work doesn't get communicated because it's not going to ever make a headline. And, I, and uh, I, I hope it's not as bad as 2080. I, I, I sincerely do. You look, at, you look at the work that's done on a lot of the committees that, uh, within Congress, and that, that's not going to always capture the headlines. But you know, specifically to the first district, the House author, or the, uh, the Defense Authorization Act, that work um, has there's a really strong bipartisan effort on the House Armed Services Committee to go and make sure that that, that, that work does survive and it, is, it gets done and it, that's never made the news, right? That's not something that gets talked about. So I, I hope to be able to challenge that seeing that there's a, and there's a lot of organizations that are, that, are, that are strongly working across the aisle to make that case. And again, you're not gonna see that being the case. As a matter of policy, what we need to do a better job is to start from a piece of common ground. If we can, you can put 100 people in the room from across the political spectrum, and if, they, if you can come together and find something that you all agree on, you should be able to build from there. And I think people are coming in from their own caucuses and their own corners, coming in with something that they just expect the other side to, to succumb to, and that's just not gonna work. An example, through this process, you get asked to take surveys, and, and, and I was able to write a position paper on the um, U.S.-Israeli relationship. And I loved it because it, got, it gave me a chance to actually communicate something, not in a yes or no type of question situation. And I got to actually talk about what's important from me. My entire first page of this, couple page paper, was that America needs to be unified in its support of Israel. Um, Israel has a democracy in the Middle East. Israel supports the LGBT community. Israel supports a diverse workplace in both their government and throughout their throughout their their business community like those are things that any member of congress if they don't support that 
about what Israel is doing, then it, you know everything else they do is falls flat. Like you can come together and find that that common ground, and then you can go and you're going to have disagreements on some of the periphery. But finding that piece of common ground and building that out, I hope that's how the committee situations work, and that there's more of it that's going on, and that it isn't a completely a 2080 situation. Thank you. Utah punches above its weight in so many areas. As a member of Utah's congressional delegation, what will you do to make the Utah delegation more cohesive? How can Utah's representatives in Congress amplify Utah's influence in Washington altogether? The Utah delegation, I think, I would just reciprocate the amount of engagement that they've given me since emerging from the primary. It's been a highlight. It's been a highlight that I've been uh, really, really excited about. Uh, you know, um, Chris Stewart and John Curtis have you know immediately reached out. I've interacted with Ben McAdams on several different issues even before, um, you know, from from previously in the in, in just here in, in Salt Lake City. Rob Bishop has you know been a really strong you know advisor and explaining things to me and just talking and giving letting me you know talk to his team about so many of the the the, the uh, issues that are going on just you have to work together as a team um and uh you know reciprocating that 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 i've had from them has been is something that i would initially do but, if, but you get tactical you got to think you know it's not really on the docket right now as we're still in a campaign but as our delegation thinks about where we need to be on committee assignments working together you know, Chris Stewart's got a really strong presence on the intelligence committee. You know, where should, if I'm, if I'm fortunate enough to be elected, where should I ultimately land and where, where would it be? So Utah has really good, strong coverage with, with six members of the federal delegation. They need to be thinking about those types of things. So we've talked about a number of issues so far, including the pandemic, economic recovery, healthcare, diversity. Now let's tackle something difficult. And let's talk about immigration reform. Oh, yeah. uh, I think it's fair to say, at least it's the position of the Salt Lake Chamber, that our current immigration system is not working. It's broken. It's creating uncertainty for those who try to navigate it. It creates economic uncertainty for Utah employers, businesses, in really every sector of the economy. So as a representative for Utah in Congress, how would you approach and hopefully address this immigration system? Yeah, uh, comprehensive immigration reform is, has evaded our country for decades um, and, and longer than that. So let's, let's, let's take it into a bite size, specifically focused on what's important for Utah. Uh, I'll try to address that initially. Um, what, industries, what industries does it affect most the h2a visa situation mm -hmm. agriculture tourism uh hospitality um and just in these last few months getting a chance to sit down with our ag our, our agriculture community particularly with the utah farm bureau and hear what issues they're they're having with this as well as going up to park city part of the district and talking about the real concern that they have of being able to get that international workforce. Right now, it, you have to just focus and streamline on that process. M have it make business sense. Right now, it, 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 it's, it's overly burdensome on the entire process from getting talent to be able to come in, uh, paying, them certain, paying them certain amounts, and, and, and all of the things that are required. There's so much requirement there. Now, they want those workers to come, and it, it is, it's, they're going to treat them the right way and we've seen that we have a lot of interest because we all go skiing and see the badge and where that person is from they're from new zealand or australia or south africa or somewhere in europe south america like that's a really really neat thing and we need to we our ski industry and our hospitality industry needs that to to exist but right now it's so cumbersome on the whole entire process and so really taking a, a look at that and fixing that immediately is what is what this area needs. Um, even, even if we're still in gridlock on figuring out a whole comprehensive immigration reform, uh, that's something that we could focus on almost right away. And a need, we saw a need for it. We saw when, when the, the pandemic hit, you know, we, weren't, we, didn't, we weren't able to have the labor force that we needed to come in and fulfill some of our most crucial, crucial industries, particularly in ag. 
Thank you. Um, now switching a little bit to supply chain and, and the industry, continuing with industry, with the recent tariffs and pandemic, supply lines for our goods and manufactured products have been strained. What are your thoughts on increasing our domestic manufacturing and critical supply chain logistics? For example, mineral, mineral supply and critical minerals needed for high tech equipment and new technologies. Yeah. Uh, a lot has been discussed on the campaign trail about a, um, a uh, manufacturing renaissance, if you will. Uh, we, 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 we got caught off guard when we weren't able to have basic equipment to help protect us from, from a virus. And um, that woke up a lot of people. We have high unemployment right now. You can directly find opportunities, particularly just in the Weber County, Box Elder County area that already have a really strong manufacturing industry. So the fact that it's a successful industry already and a bit atypical, because as the US has gone to, a, in my opinion, way too much of a consumer-based economy, is, is if you have companies that are already doing really well in that, in that industry, that will incentivize more to come. And it's a, basically an opportunity of scale where we'll be able to, to create that because the workforce and the labor is already there. Um, and you know, a lot of the infrastructure is already there. So that, that's one thing. I bring it back to ag. We all walked through the aisles in March and in the richest country in the world saw bare aisles of food. Um, that scared a lot of people, but it wasn't because we didn't have enough food production. It was a distribution channel. Our, our, our agriculture system has gone, we've all gone to restaurants more. In the last 20 years, the distribution has moved more towards restaurants than it is to the end consumer. That got completely disrupted. So we need to be thinking about that type of that type of um, supply chain and, and, and just get good, smart, thoughtful people you know, on that. Regulation or no, uh, policy has led to way too much food production also being from out of the country. So focusing on that, we've had to get in emergency situations like up in Greeley, Colorado, where there was gonna be, uh, the, the lamb industry was gonna be decimated if they didn't have anywhere to, to, to you know, our ranchers here were, were gonna be able to put their, put their lamb there. We have to be able to protect that and encourage local, production of not only ag, but new opportunities for manufacturing. Another issue that's important to the business community and to our community broadly is housing affordability. You probably know that Utah suffers from one of the greatest housing shortages and affordability challenges in the Western US. And businesses are concerned that their employees can't find affordable housing and they are especially concerned that maybe that what they can find is not located close to where they work. Do you believe, Blake, that the federal government has a role in addressing the need of affordable housing? And if so, what, what is that role? Well, um, whether I believe it does or not, it does, because this question I get asked more often than I ever expected. Mm. Uh, but the essence of the question wants to figure out if there is a role for the federal government to play. So, so I get that. But the fact that it's asked so frequently really does highlight how important it is. And we do need comprehensive solutions here. Uh, so there is a role. Um, the most acute way to address it, in my opinion, is still going to be locally. Zoning policies, you know, done by city governments, right? And, um, and being really thoughtful about, you know, looking at best practices and finding ways to address that. The, the not in my backyard sort of mentality that does exist, like at some point something's got to give and we've, we've, we've got to make sure that, uh, or we've got to be able to address that, right? That's mostly done locally, that's through communication and, 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 and showing real data that will, will, will show how this can be, you know, good solution for all. But with respect to the federal government, it's transportation, it's, it's infrastructure, it's transportation. If we can alleviate some of the congestion based on you know, making sure Utah gets its fair share from, from infrastructure projects. So that not, all, that not just making sure, you know, not just building out for the future for our highway system, but really investing in, um, really investing in uh, public transportation. I work with, you know, we're sort of, our firm was sort of off of, a, really close to being off of the front runner line. We saw a big shift in our workforce being willing to fire up their Wi-Fi on the train as they're coming in, uh, using it as they leave, leave to go home. Uh, it's such a good option for, for a lot of people. We, we, we need to be able to encourage that as much as possible. That's a, that's a net positive across the board. Figuring out first mile, last mile issues, 
Uh, so people are more encouraged to, to be able to go and use public transportation, all, all things that the federal government and you know, that our delegation can be focused on. Like what are your views in relation to the minimum wage? Do you support raising the minimum wage? So uh, government, again, I don't, they can't solve this problem. I support creating really good, uh, making sure that we have affordable and nimble education so we can go get the more high paying jobs, making sure that people have access to that. That's how you solve it in my opinion. It, it's not just arbitrarily changing a certain number on, on an income statement on a W-2. This is about, uh, companies are incentivized to, to pay more because in, in Utah where we always see low unemployment and we're leading the country right now, uh, if, if a firm is not incentivizing their employees, they're going to lose them. That's the biggest cost uh, with respect to talent in any organization is attrition. And so they're already incentivized to, to properly and, 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 to, and to adequately pay their employees. Um, I would just say instead of you know, making that of a change, invest in our education and make sure that we can fill new jobs of America. Let's talk about the federal deficit. This is something that even before the pandemic, for last, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we heard, we've heard a lot about it in the past. And before the pandemic, we were adding about a trillion dollars a year to the federal deficit, which is uh, at the time, it was about 20 trillion. It's hard to even comprehend such a number. Now with the federal relief, we're probably at the end of this year, gonna add another three or four trillion. Tell us your view about the federal deficit. Are you worried about it? And how will your thoughts on it inform policies that you will or will not support as a member of Congress? So yeah, I'm very worried about it. It got me into the race. As a 39 year old, middle of his career, young family, uh, I've read the biographies of the architects of the 1997 budget deal. And we, we did it, we did it not less than 25 years ago, that we could get ourselves to a balanced budget and start creating a surplus, at least on an annual basis. Um, it's, a diff, it's a more difficult situation now, but it was within our lifetimes. This isn't something that is, is, is unattainable, but it's gonna, it's gonna take a lot of work and it's gonna take people to be disciplined in order to do this. So very worried about it, it's an obvious piece. Um, I had the opportunity to talk to Paul Ryan the other day um, and he shares that same exact sentiment. He's talking about the reserve status of our currency. And if, if that gets called into question, it's not just a hit to our American economy. This is Western civilization. This is an enormously huge deal. We have not seen this level of percentage off of GDP since World War II. We are in uncharted territory at this point, and we have to reverse the culture, the debt culture. Um, and you know, it's first gonna come in how we address our entitlement and, and, and reforming this so it's more sustainable. Uh, and we have to look across the board at everything and seeing where there's enormous amount of waste. And Again, I'm one of 435 members. I know our federal delegation is committed to it as well, so add in another five folks, but uh, we have to be able to address this and be smart. But we have a roadmap. It was done you know, two decades ago. We can do this. Blake, we're coming up on the last two minutes of our time with you, and we wanna give that two minutes to you. If there's anything that we haven't asked that you wanna highlight, or if you wanna just summarize some of your thoughts today, we wanna have you with the last word. Um, you know, I'll, what I would say is it's great to be at the chamber today. Um, when I decided to run for Congress and I was kind of writing a, I was writing a policy brief just to help, you know, succinctly explain, you know, the way I think about, uh, certain things. Education was one that came up. I have sat in this room right here for presentations from leaders in our community. President Mortensen from Weber State, Astrid Tamina, President Timinas from Utah Valley and others, they particularly talked about the dual track, the dual path to their, you know, they've got their um, degree program and then their credentialing and certi certification program, helping more acutely, immediately help people find jobs that are high paying and, and worth pursuing. And then at another forum that, that was hosted here, uh, I, I sat and listened to the leaders in our tech colleges. So, I, you know, I mentioned education a few times just in casually talking about it. It is an underpinning that's really, really important. And I love the work that the Salt Lake Chamber has done. So well before there was a pandemic and a need for, you know, more, you know, a, a change in our economy and a disruption there and the need for 
for education, like I knew that right going into it. And then I had been informed and, and educated on that just from my interactions with the chamber. They, these are, this, is the, these are, this is an important organization that exists throughout the entire state. And um, my, if, I'm, if I'm fortunate to be elected, my congressional office will love to work closely and provide that input. I said it first, work hard and be willing for input. That's where you see a lot of success and it's something that I sincerely will, will, will make an effort when, you know, if I'm, if I'm in office. Blake Moore, candidate for Congress in Utah's first congressional district. Thank you so much for joining us today. Abby, Derek, thanks so much. I appreciate the time. We're gonna excuse yep. Blake yep. now, invite him to exit stage left. And as he does so, we'll invite our next candidate to come in. And we're grateful for the time that we had to spend with Blake and to spend with our next candidate who Abby will introduce. I believe seconds just while we introduce our candidate, uh, Darren Perry and give him some time. Hey, welcome, Darren Perry. Darren Perry is the tribal leader of the Northwestern Band of the Shoshone Nation, a Utah tribe. He serves on, on the board of directors of the American West Heritage Center. Darren also teaches American Indian history at the Utah State University and is the proud father of nine children and 13 grandchildren. Councilman Perry, thank you so much for joining us today. And to begin, would you tell us why you are running for Congress? Well, thank you. I'm running for Congress because I think it's time that we have a, a different voice. And growing up in the Native American culture, I know what it meant to me. And one of the most important things is uh, we had no concept of personal property. And so we were only as good as the community as, as our most vulnerable. And all of those things have seeped into my political philosophy. Uh, I'm a guest lecturer at a lot of different places, and I made the statement one time that uh, I can't change history, and I don't want to change history, but I can change the future, and so can you. And then I talked about how the greatest crimes in the history of our country are not caused by hatred, but by indifference. And it's time for good people to stand up and make a difference. Well, I had somebody call me the next day and said, do you really believe what you said? And I said, absolutely, I do. And he said, well, you need to run for Congress. And, and that planted the seed and it got me here today. I just think it's, it's important that people have a choice, a good choice. I love Blake Moore, I think he's a great guy. I just don't think he's the right guy for this time in the country where there's so much divisiveness. And, and uh, yeah, other than that, you know, I'm just honored to be here and honored to be a part of the, the first district. Thank you, Darren, and we're honored to host you here at the Chamber today and appreciate you taking some time with us. The question I want to ask you about is the economy. It's not a surprise to any of us that we're in the middle of a pandemic and it's having serious impacts both on public health as well as on economic health. I'd be interested to know your, what would be your number one priority as a member of Congress, both in the short term as well as in our long-term economic recovery? Let's look at short-term first. We're still in the pandemic. And, and as we've seen the last few days, we're actually spiking and going up to numbers that we saw months ago. Short-term, we need to make sure 
the, on a federal government side that uh, we continue to provide unemployment insurance to those who have been affected by it, mostly our service industry and those restaurants and things that are so vital to our economy. Uh, it's really important that we maintain that for those people. I think the PPP was a wonderful uh, addition. I think it, it helped. And so those two things right there, short term, as long as we're in the pandemic, I think it's vitally important that we take care of them. Long term, cut regulations. I'm probably the only Democrat you'll ever hear <laughs> that says the government sometimes gets in the way of businesses being able to do business. And so I, I firmly believe, and I've lived in CD1 my whole life, which is a lifeblood of small businesses uh, and rural business. The CEOs of those companies are also the HR director. They're also the finance director. And so anything that we can do to cut business regulations long-term to help companies succeed and grow, make sure we have programs with SBA that help companies get low to no interest loans, especially as we ramp back up and get serious about growing our economy again, and uh, really start living within our means. I think the state of Utah has done a fantastic job having that rainy day fund. And, and I'll tell you on the federal level, we're going to be in trouble if we don't start making decisions based on uh, living within our means. And that's really important to me. Thank you. Councilman, you mentioned rural businesses. I'd like to ask a little bit about rural education. The pandemic has brought to light the need for every student to have a device and an adequate home broadband connection. How would you propose modernizing the broadband funding to make sure that every student who is a dean has a device and a home connection? What, if any role, should the state, should the state play? Specifically, how will you meet broadband needs in rural Utah? Well, being a federal leader, I've always believed that decisions made on the state level are the best. So what can I do as a federal uh, uh, representative to help the state succeed and grow this out? And, and the biggest thing would be funding, making sure we look at ways to not only fund broadband internet, which is vital, which is key, but to make it affordable. There's a lot of broadband companies that won't go to rural Utah because there's not enough people to make it economically viable for them but we've got to figure out a way and if the federal government needs to, to subsidize or make it more appealing for companies to get out there to do that, that's what we need to do. We need to make sure our digital platforms are up, our technology is good, because it solves three things in rural Utah. And I'm in rural Utah. CD1 is mostly rural. You can get an education now. Uh, if COVID has taught us anything, it's what we can do from home now. So we can get an education, even a four-year degree. We can uh, see a doctor. My last three doctor visits have been online. And look at the job opportunities that exist there today. We have learned that we can do more things from home, from a computer, if we have that broadband internet, than we ever thought possible until, and COVID has shown us that we could, but we need to make sure the infrastructure is in place and not only for rural Utah, but for our children. I, I've heard uh, my Navajo friends call me all the time and say, our children are sitting outside a, a restaurant because they don't have internet at home and they try to get on the internet at the local restaurant. That's not acceptable in the year 2020 in the United States and we can do better. Let's talk for a moment about healthcare. This is something that Congress has grappled with for a number of years now, often with controversy. In Utah, about 60% of the population receives their health insurance through their employers because of their job. And most businesses report that it is their second highest expense after wages. With Utah businesses and Utah families struggling to manage those growing health care costs, 
What are some of the things that you believe, Darren, Congress can do to help address the urgent need and to get something resolved? When the Affordable Care Act came out years ago, I uh, looked at the whole process and I thought, you know, I, I, I had a problem with one part of it. And one, the problem I had a par problem with was the part that you were penalized if you did not sign up. And I always thought that was unfair because it really targeted the, the underserved communities that didn't have the money anyway. And so once that provision was taken away, until I see something different, and I've heard Republicans say, well, you know, we want to keep our health care. Look, I'm not for a one-payer system at all. I think those that have a good health care plan uh, should be able to keep it. I have a health care plan through my employer, and it goes up every year like quite a bit. And so I don't know how that's sustainable long term. But I do know this. I think we can find ways to strengthen the Affordable Care Act, find ways to uh, get more people under that safety net and expand. Look, the, the residents of Utah voted to expand uh, Medicaid. And the legislature has been really, really slow to respond to that. And they can do it cheap. I mean, 15 cents on $100. And so the idea that we can't meet more needs, and I think the Affordable Care Act, because we have it today in the pre-existing conditions, 200,000 more Utahns have health care today because of it. And until somebody can show me an alternative, then, then I think that's the way to go. But can we fix it a little bit better? Absolutely. And working with both sides of the aisle on this is going to be critical to making sure all Americans have health care. I think that's an American right. I, I don't think it's something that, well, if you have a good job, you can do it. I have a single daughter who has a baby. She can only afford rent or she can afford health care. She can't do both. And, and we've got to do something better. Thank you. Thank you. Although we're not always recognized as such, Utah is a very diverse place. Here at the Salt Lake Chamber, we are actively engaged to make sure that this moment of focus on the importance of equality and opportunity, diversity, and inclusion does not pass without resulting in real change. As a representative of Utah in Congress, how will you ensure that Utah is viewed and actually is an equitable, diverse, and inclusive place to live and do business in? That's funny that, you know, we, we talk about this. I was the keynote speaker at a diversity conference at Utah State University. This is in my wheelhouse. This is what's important to me. And, and, I, and I would agree with you. I think Salt Lake County, Salt Lake City, the urban areas are much more diverse than what I see in Box Elder County or what I see in the Uinta Basin. The Uinta Basin now that with the oil is much more diverse than it was. Utah State's diverse because it has a major university there. But we still have a little bit of work to do. And it's important. Look, the religious tone and, the, and why Utah was founded was founded on principles of inclusion and making sure everybody has a seat at the table. Now, we've always not got there. But uh, the fact that we're talking about it, we're striving to do the right thing, I think is really critical. I'm a Native American leader. We have never had a seat at the table, ever. I'm one of those uh, marginalized groups. I've worked tirelessly the last few years to give us a seat at the table, give us a voice, because that's what really diverse communities want. They want a seat at the table and they want to have a voice. They want to be heard. I think Dr. King said that riots are the voice of the unheard. As we bring these diverse groups together, listen to them and really listen to them and, and include them in the conversation, I think we do a much better job of uh, governing just urban areas and outlining areas where, uh, where I live and where you know, most of my constituents would live. But yeah, it's a big problem, but I think we tackle it in a good way. And I think our local leaders are doing everything they can to make sure those, those groups are heard and recognized. 
I'm sure you wouldn't be surprised to hear me say that politics is polarizing. <laughs> and it seems that maybe becoming even more so and divides becoming even greater. The question, Darren, is how you as a member of Congress would, would bridge those divides. And I shared with Blake when he was here my own personal experience. I used to be legal counsel for Congress. And okay. when I worked for Congress, people would often ask me, what is it like working for the U.S. Congress? And I would say, well, you know the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of the time we work and get things done. 20% of the time we fight and argue. But you only hear about the 20% of the time <laughs> in the true. press. But when I talk to my colleagues, who still work for Congress today, they sometimes share with me that it's just the opposite, that now it seems like they're fighting 80% of the time and feel lucky if they can get things done 20% of the time. What would your approach be, Darren, for, for bridging those divides? I would take what I've learned here as a tribal leader. Look, Native American tribes have never, the government has never had our best interest at heart, ever. And so I've been able over the last few years, uh, I have such a wonderful relationship with the current administration here, with our congressional leaders, because I have a seat at the table. I've sat with them and solved problems for not only all of Utahns, but Native American communities, these marginalized communities. And uh, I've done it in such a way that's not confrontational, that gives people the opportunity to speak their mind without being belittled or put down. And so my experience doing that, and that's why I, I think that this election cycle is more about policy. It, there's so much more to it than policy. It's about healing this division that seems to be here now. And it is increasing at, at a huge rate every day. And so listening, having a, a very non-confrontational point of view and, and really trying to see somebody else's point of view, I'll tell you what's killing Congress today, and not only Congress, but our communities, is the partisanship. When I saw, and I didn't watch a lot of it, but when uh, they impeached the President of the United States and they voted to impeach and then they voted, you know, Everybody voted party lines almost to the person. And I look at over 500 members that represent Congress and the Senate, and I think, are, are you serious? There's no, everybody voted party lines. I can't imagine that everybody thought the same because I, I don't think the same as, as my colleagues. And, and so that taught me right there that People are afraid to stand up. I admire Mitt Romney, whether you like him or don't like him. I'll tell you, I admire him because he's willing to make a decision that he thought was best, whether you like it or not. I admire that quality, and I thought he was about the only one that had that, the guts to, to vote the way he did. And then to see the, the heat he took for voting his conscience, that's why people won't vote for what they really feel like is important to them. The heat from the, their own constituents, uh, it's that divisive. And so I made a commitment uh, before I got in that I will never, ever, ever put party over people. I will never put the party over the people of the first district, their values. Their values are my values and making sure that their values are represented. And if it comes down to the party wanting me to do something that I feel is contrary to what the good people of CD1 need, then I will absolutely vote in favor of my constituents. That leads us right into our next question, Councilman. Um, as Utah punches above its weight uh, in so many areas, as a member of Utah's congressional delegation, what will you do to make Ut the Utah delegation more cohesive? How can Utah's representatives in Congress amplify our influence in Washington? Yeah, you know, I don't know if they hang out. You know, we've got represent. I don't know if they get along. I don't. I, I don't know that much about it. But we need to start looking for what's good for America, and and whether uh, 
the Republicans have had a pretty much stranglehold on what we have here. And so um, I think that's a problem. I think when you don't have a diversity in thought and action, I think that's a problem. And so uh, the first thing I would do is, is get sit down with all the, the leaders from Congress in Utah and say, look, we have an obligation here to do what's right for the people of Utah and put them first over party, over anything else. And what can I do to work with you to make this better? Because we've got to make it better. We, we cannot keep going down the path we're going. And we've got to start putting a, the people of Utah first. And as we do that, everything else will take care of itself. We've thrown some tough questions at you so far. Are you ready for an easy one now? <laughs> yeah. Immigration reform. That's oh. an easy one, isn't it? Absolutely. We uh, at the Salt Lake Chamber, we believe that uh, the current immigration system is not working as it should. In fact, I'd go so far as to say it's broken. It creates uncertainty for people who are trying to navigate the system, and it certainly creates uncertainty, economic uncertainty for Utah employers in really every sector of our economy. As a member of Congress, how would you approach and hopefully address our immigration system? Thank you for that question because it's important. Uh, I'm a very moderate Democrat. Uh, I almost lost the primary because of it, but I'm very moderate until you come to a couple of things and one of them is immigration. I absolutely believe that we need to fix, before we almost do anything else, the policy that we have. It, it baffles me that uh, our lawmakers, how long have we had this problem? It, it, and, and we haven't fixed it yet. And, and I think we've got to do all we can to make sure that's fixed. Uh, a poll of Utah, 71% of Utah believe that uh, in the DACA program and believe giving citizenship to the dreamers those children that were brought here illegally by parents. That is something the state of Utah supports and it, it fits into the wheelhouse of who the people of Utah are. And so we owe it to them to fix the system. I'm not a border wall person. I think we can take care of the securing our borders through technologies and other things, but absolutely wall sends the wrong message. And I think we need a blue card system that allows agricultural workers, dairy workers to come into the country, work for a few years, and then have a pathway to citizenship if they, if they uh, do everything that they're supposed to. Our service industries. Uh, I live up in the northern end of Utah, and when I go to Snow Basin to ski, uh, every worker there is from South America. We've got to do a better job in making sure those who come, if they want to come for religious persecution or uh, political reasons, that they have an opportunity to do so, that there's a path forward for them. Imagine the immigration system we have today if we would have had it in 1492. None of us would be here. My, I would be here <laughs> and my family would be here but nobody else would be here. If we would have built a wall. Imagine what that looks like. I loved when my grade school teacher told me that the United States is the great melting pot of the world. That really resonated with me as a, a child because I thought, man, I have my Italian friends. I have all these people with diverse and rich cultures that really enlighten our lives and make our lives so much better. And and having a strong immigration system that allows people that have been oppressed to come here. Brigham Young came here because of the oppression. And, and I think the state of Utah does a good job with our refugee program and, and other things, but we absolutely on the federal level need to make this a top priority. And I would be more than happy to lead that charge. Thank you. With the recent tariffs and the pandemic, supply lines for our goods and manufactured products have been strained. How would you go about, or what are your thoughts on increasing our domestic manufacturing and critical supply chain logistics? For example, mineral, min, mineral supply for critical materials needed for high-tech equipment and new technologies. You don't think about minerals in, in our tech world, but 
they're throughout the whole tech world. Uh, I believe the United States is big enough and has enough resources to supply all of it. Our problem is we rely on China for our antibiotics. We rely on other countries to to manufacture things for us. I mean, really important things that we rely on daily. Uh, I had a dinner the other night with a, a rancher, a sheep rancher, good friend, the Wild family, and uh, and I, I I talked to him about this, and he said, you know what, I there's nobody in the U.S. that will buy our wool. We have to send it outside of the country. That to me is crazy. We live in the greatest country in the world, and we cannot supply our own supplies in certain areas. And until we get more manufacturing facilities for critical need things, and we're not relying on other countries to provide us with personal protection equipment, uh, we're going to struggle. What was disheartening for me is after the pandemic really hit, going to a grocery store and seeing some of the shelves bare with, with commodities that I've taken for granted that I can get. Uh, and I, I knew it was short term, but still, we have to have the ability to manufacture, especially the critical things. And I'll tell you what else has really hurt is, is some of our outdoor industry has really suffered because a lot of the product is made in China. And so when you have tariffs and you have a trade war with, with arguably manufacturing wise, one of the greatest powers along with us, it, and we rely on that, and not having a good relationship with them is going to strain the system. So I'd love to see manufacturing be brought back home. It provides more jobs, why wouldn't we? And our local farmers need to sell their product here, we need to buy it here, and we need to make sure we take care of each other in that respect. I'm sure you're well aware of this next issue because of the work you've done in the community for a long time, and that is housing affordability. Mm. Utah suffers from one of the greatest housing shortages and affordability challenges in the West. Chamber members as businesses, they're increasingly concerned that employees can't find housing and they have an especially hard time finding housing nearby where they work. Do you believe that the federal government has a role in addressing this problem? And if so, what is that role and how would you move it forward as a member of Congress? Yeah. Housing is a big, big thing. Everybody wants to, to move here. I watched uh, the nightly news last night, and these California homeowners are talking about moving here now, moving out of state and leaving. Where are they going to leave? To the greatest place on earth. I mean, the recreational opportunities we have here. So the federal government's role should be, uh, there's so many loan programs that we can do. We can provide loans for families that just can't quite make it. Uh, I, I had a friend that had a small family growing up and his, his rent was subsidized by the federal government. We've got to make housing affordable. We got to maybe give tax credits to developers that are willing to um, invest in planned communities that are close to workplaces, but they need to be affordable homes walkable homes, homes that the store is centrally located and they get to. But the housing crisis really worries me in Utah. But I think there's a, a role the federal government can play. Look, I don't believe the federal government should have their hands in every pot. And I think we need to, but where we can, we need to make sure we give the financial resources to those people that need it most and especially incentivize the public and private sector to uh, actually start building these homes for people that critically need it and want to stay here. Darren, we're coming up on just a couple of minutes left in our time with you, and we want to give you the last word. <laughs> if there's anything that we haven't talked about that you want to make sure that you share, or if you want to summarize some of the things that we have talked about, the time is yours. Thank you. Uh, the only thing I'd like to say is, is this election is about uh, leadership. I love Blake Moore and I've said, I said it earlier, but I think about what kind of leader I would be at, 
the age of 40. And the, the two of us were at the Cache County Chamber of Commerce the other day, and I sat and I watched him, and he's dynamic, and he, he had so many ideas, and he didn't have notes. I had notes, but he's just talking about things, and I thought, I think I was like that at 40. But I look at the leadership qualities I had at 40 and the leadership qualities that I have today, and those, what those 20 years have taught me. Uh, I've been through the fire. I've been through hard times. And, and Blake's dad could tell him, were you a better leader at 40 or were you a better leader at 60? And, and that's the difference. But I think that's what America needs today. It needs to uh, have a voice that's calming, a voice that brings people together because that's what I've been doing for the last 10 years. And it's proven. And, and I know it can work on, on the national level. So there's a reason Indian chiefs are old. They're wise. They've seen it. They don't have to comment every time somebody makes a statement because they know. And then they let everybody talk and then they talk. And, and I just look at it that way too. Uh, I think I'm the right candidate for the position. I'm the only candidate that lives in the area. I've lived there my whole life. I don't know how somebody from East Bench and Salt Lake can represent the values of those who live in Grouse Creek, Utah, or the Uinta Basin. Uh, his life is not the lives of those people. And so uh, I, I think it's critical, especially this cycle more than any other cycle. Darren Perry, candidate for Congress from Utah's first congressional district. Thank you so much for joining well, us today. My pleasure, thanks for having me. And thank you, Abby, for being my co-host for this <laughs> candidate pleasure. forum. And thanks to all of the chamber members and others who've joined us today. As a reminder, we hold these candidate forums uh, through the next few weeks for all of Utah's major races every Tuesday at 4 p.m. You can follow us as they're streamed live. We also want to remind you that this Thursday, we have the one exception, which is our gubernatorial candidate forum Thursday at 4 p.m. And we look forward to joining you there.